well to our second portion today today uh, and this is the in person portion and i'm really excited that you made it here welcome uh, I want to start with acknowledging, I'm Bettina Burianka from the Goethe Institute of San Francisco, and I want to start with acknowledging that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatosh Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respect by acknowledging the ancestors, the elders, and relatives of the Ramatish community. Welcome to this in-person portion, and that means a lot because we had uh, an in-person portion yesterday already. And now being back, uh, not exactly back because we are today at the lab, and yesterday it was the Exploratorium, is really great because it's also always making a huge difference to be together in a space. And especially special is that we have a really hands-on workshop, um, as you can see or think already, with Jonathan Keats. And I'm so happy to introduce him. Before I do that, I want to say thank you to all our partners, especially City Lights. Good. Thank you so very much. And and also the MIT Press and the Center for International Security Studies at University of Sydney. Jonathan Keats is known as Poet of Ideas by the New, York, the New Yorker and a multimedia philosopher, prophet, that's amazing title, I feel, by the Atlantic. I didn't pay him for it. <laughs> I would have if I had known that I could. That's great, I love it. An artist, writer, and experimental philosopher, his unique uh, ability to blend art, philosophy, and technology into conceptually driven interdisciplinary projects sends really out to me. Over the past two decades, he has dazzled audiences with his innovative creations and institutions from Arizona State University to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art they have eagerly hosted his work. He has exhibited and lectured at uh, do dozens of institutions all over the world. I won't dive into that. And he is the author of six books on subjects ranging from science and technology to art and design. Most recently, this I want to mention, the book, You Belong to the Universe. Buckminster Fuller and the Future, published by Oxford University Press. He is currently a fellow at the Bergwin Institute, a research associate at the University of Arizona, a visiting scholar at San Jose State University, an advisor in metadisciplinary studies at the University of Zurich, a research fellow at the Highlands Institute and the Long Now Foundation, principal philosopher at Earth Law Center and an artist in residence at Hyundai and a few more. He co-directs the Interspecies Justice Working Group at Colby um, College and the Consortium for Climate Adapted Cultural Heritage. As an artist, he is represented by the Modernism Gallery here in San Francisco. Also, I want to mention his monograph with the title Thought Experiments that has been recently published. Today, he presents deep time photography for future generations. And I can't wait to dive into that. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, Bettina, for braving that biography that we like to see shortened a little bit and thank you to the Lights and the Institute for hosting me today in particular Pina and Peter. So the theme of this weekend is for the protection of all being. This is a title given to a journal by Lawrence Berlinghetti quite a while ago and we're still not really living up to it. 
And we've had myriad ways in which we've been engaging this over the weekend already. But I'd like to maybe take this as an opportunity to step back and to ask, how do we protect all beings? How might we go about it? And to think about this in terms that are multi-species and multi-generational, to really think about all beings in the most expansive sense of the word. And as I think about that, I realize that I'm singularly ill-equipped to do anything meaningful because I'm living in the here and now, and I don't know how much longer I have to go, but relatively speaking, I am not going to be here for all that long. The impact of my actions will be much greater than I can possibly even imagine. And also many other beings, many other species have been around for much longer than I have been and will be for much longer than I will be, including the marvelous bristlecone pine trees on Mount Washington in Eastern Nevada that I've had the privilege of working with through the Long Now Foundation, which is represented by Danielle Engelman today. This led me to think about what we might potentially do, what I might potentially do, what we all might potentially do, and specifically how we might address this discrepancy between our own lifespan and the impact of our actions in terms that can be construed as deep time. I don't mean this in the strictly geological sense, which is extraordinarily long, though we can certainly go there. I also mean it in the intergenerational sense. I mean it in the sense of the lifespan of oak trees, of myriad beings that live longer than we do. So I'd like to make a proposal to all of you, an invitation, which is I'd like to propose that we reconsider surveillance, not really a term that is looked upon kindly by probably anybody in this room. I'm rather uncomfortable with it. And that's why I think we potentially need to look at this and think about what it might be that it is not. What if instead of surveillance being something that the government was undertaking, watching over you or your neighbors for that matter, what if it were to be in deep time in a way that those who are most affected by our actions today, but least empowered in terms of influencing them, that they were the ones watching us? What if we were, in other words, to create a means by which to record to preserve all that we do now in the large sense of the word, in the sense of the word that's more expansive than just on a day-to-day -day basis, but the impact of those actions. And that were to be something that was available to those not yet born. What sort of feedback mechanism might that result in? Are there ways in which this could potentially lead us to act more responsibly? more responsibly at least, to, to recognize that we're being watched and to, to change the picture, make the picture what we would like those in the far future to see. So what we're gonna be doing today is not necessarily making surveillance counts. There are a number of ways in which I'm going to propose to you that you can approach this workshop. That's one of them. But all of the ways in which I'm hoping will manifest today are ways in which to enter into a dialogue that is not one we ordinarily enter into, a dialogue that is multi-generational, a dialogue that is multi-species, a dialogue that is through deep time over a longer span than we can ordinarily experience for ourselves. And to do this with a sort of a prosthesis, a uh, philosophical or psychological prosthesis, a, a device that can help us to, to get outside of our own minds and to look in upon ourselves from the outside. What I'm proposing is that we make cameras, cameras that have an exposure time of 100 years. 
And that sounds crazy. And the likelihood of any of these cameras actually resulting in a photograph that will be visible in 100 years is minimal at best. That's why there are a lot of you in the room. It increases the chances of but it also is really meant for us, meant for us to be able to think about these questions in the here and now. And so in front of each of you are the materials to make one of these cameras. And what I would like to do to begin with is to take a moment with all of you to think about a place somewhere in the world that matters to you, a place that matters because you would like for it to remain as it is today for those in the future to enjoy, a place that is in some way exemplary of the problems that we face, a place you would like to see change. And having thought about that for a minute or two, this isn't very long, I know, I'm gonna then ask that we briefly go around the room, give your name and also tell everybody what place you've chosen and why it matters to you, just in a single line. So let's take a couple minutes. Okay, those were a couple of very brief minutes, but in the time span of 100 years, who's counting? <laughs> So who would like to volunteer? Who would like to say just in a, in a few words where to, to introduce yourself and to say where and what that these, what the place means to you? Not to get into why you want it to remain as it is or why you want it to change, but simply tell us a little bit about the place. Um, I picked this little bay in Greece, <laughs> and uh, sorry, <laughs> um, and they it oh, um, it's very special to me because, as Rimbo said, it's where the the um, the sun meets the sky sea, and. It is probably, I'm not a religious person, but uh, I've had very ecstatic spiritual experiences. To me, so. Perfect. So let's get a few more. Oh, and, and what is your name? Julie. Yes, Daniel. Um, hi, my name is Daniel. I'm happy to be here. Um, so in the foothills of the peninsula, the grasses smell amazing. And all of that land that is full of houses and commerce and the same left for people and for all the beings on the planet um, is because of the work of a few small people who established a trust and managed to preserve it, even though it was adjacent to Silicon Valley. So possible. Get a, a couple more, and I'll, I'll catch you up um, in a moment. I'll, I'll go in first. Um, <laughs> my name is Peter, and the location I choose is in the heart of Athens, Greece, in a dingy, what used to be a very dingy neighborhood where the old Rebetica artists, where the Greek cholos who used to sell cocaine, used to reside. And this particular location is called the Juan Rodriguez. It is a bar which is an artifice, a complete artifice, it's something that uh, Huizman would have loved, absolutely. And the, the, the rock star Willie Blotten offered to purchase this bar for me if I were to leave City Lights, where I work, uh, to take over this bar. And, and I absolutely love this bar because it is just, it has nothing to do with Greece at all. It's, it's really this kind of an artifice that is sort of bits of Brazil and bits of Spain, and, but it's, it's, you know, it's still nonetheless. Quite a lovely fantasy. Yes, Mattel. Uh, I just I was thinking of villages of Mali, Mali in Africa. I would because I've been living there several years, 
and it's amazing how they the way they live it's like the republic of plato and they follow the moon not the, the cycle they not the sun cycle they need to following the moon cycle so yeah i mean it's really a special place great well, i'm glad to have so many utopians in the room and poets poets let's say mm -hmm. so you can continue this conversation with each other around the table but just to keep us going here i'm going to now propose to all of you that you imagine that place in a hundred years. In terms of your imagination, you can go wherever, wherever it may lead you, which could be predictive, could be what you hope for that place, could be what you dread or fear most. Whatever that vision is, you have in front of you the makings of these cameras. Specifically, you'll see that there are wooden boxes. And the boxes have the have a hole drilled in them where you will place a pinhole later. For now, what you will do, if you would like, is to open the boxes, nothing inside, no tricks here, and to represent on the inside of the box, however you choose, with whatever material you want, that vision that you have. And we're going to take around half an hour or so to do that. And ideally, this is a time for you also to get to know each other and talk about some of these the questions that have already come up and questions much better than those that, that I have thought to ask. But you'll see that there are materials on your tables. There also are communal materials in the middle, well, like, like kindergarten. And like kindergarten, let's be respectful of the tables. And if you're going to use one of the razor knives, there's cardboard there to cut on. And we will reconvene in around half an hour. Yeah. Should we use all the people in the box? Or just the Whatever you like. Whatever you want. It's up to you. And if you want to do something else, you. you're welcome to do something else. I don't want to restrict you in any way. Um, I will say that if you work in the camera in three dimensions, which some people do, just to keep in mind that the way in which camera works, because effectively you will have light that will be coming through this pinhole and that will be projecting onto the back. And that's where image will, will gradually fade into the black paper, as I'll explain in more detail later. So anything you put in between is going to be in between. That could be negative or positive. I don't mean in a moral sense, I mean in a technological or technical sense here. So in other words, it'll cast shadow. It will it'll obscure the image. That's up to you. Whatever you want to do, two-dimensional, three-dimensional. If you can do four or five dimensional, I will give bonus points. If you get above 13 dimensions, <laughs> you get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> And I'll I'll be here circulating. I'll come over to one. Thank you.